sure your cell phones are either off or on uh, uh, bill. I'm gonna send on vibrate. To the whole list of um, bills. Yeah, probably tomorrow because there, there's so a bunch I guess that we're got on. dropped today. And then you can do what I, I've been tracking, doing a, like a quick summary of bills. Okay, um, I'm gonna call to order this uh, public workshop uh, on Wednesday, January 15th of the City of Sebastian um, Council. Uh, this isn't actually a council meeting, it's a workshop. Uh, it's gonna be uh, led by Dr. DeFries. He's gonna introduce himself because there's no way I could tell you all about him. You probably all know more about him than I do. Um, one thing to remember is our objective in this workshop and in the next workshop is to try to work through um, the issues that were raised in the city manager's report and his presentation and try to come to some conclusions. And Dr. DeFries will facilitate that and um, we'll kind of work with each individual as they want to speak. It's a free form workshop. You can come to the mic. Uh, the reason for that, of course, is we're recording this. We want to redo it. If you don't come to the mic, you won't get on the recording. So you can come to the mic and, um, and carry on a conversation with the, the moderator. Uh, city council members are not going to be unless they choose to, to input, are not necessarily going to be involved in this. Uh, it's primarily a public workshop. It's for the public to actually input and talk about this issue. Um, so with that, Dr. Freese. Can we have a prayer and pledge of allegiance? I'm sorry? A prayer and pledge of allegiance? Oh, skipping that. All right, let's have a moment of silence and pledge of allegiance. I'm sorry. <coughs> Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, good evening, everybody. I'm going to do a really short introduction to myself. I'm the executive director of the Indian River Lagoon National Estuary Program. Our offices are just next door in the, the old uh, high school. And I want to thank uh, the mayor and the council and city manager uh, for actually having this discussion. You are not the only community that's wrestling with water quality uh, concerns. You know, how do you do comprehensive you know, management of vegetation in aquatic areas? And, and so this is an issue that is uh, statewide uh, issue. It's being addressed by cities, counties, and even the state of Florida. And so we at the National Estuary Program really look at this in a more of a nutrient way. And I want to make sure that we are all together, you know, in understanding how this is going to work ton tonight. Uh, council is going to listen to your comments, your concerns, and, and hopefully you've brought some good ideas to the table. Uh, we're going to be respectful. We're going to be polite. Uh, we are not going to r try to rehash, you know, whether glyphosate is a human health threat or not. The goal tonight is to try to begin the discussion within the city of Sebastian about how to move forward with a comprehensive, you know, aquatic weed management program and pest management program and to look at the options available to the city uh, look at some of those associated costs and then you know the challenge for the council and the mayor uh, working with you all will be to you know build a plan uh, that works you know from multiple perspectives you know this what you all you know expect in the city what's a you know what you can do financially and and just as a, a visual kind of view of this as I see it you don't want to take tools off the table. Multiple tools are always good. But what you do want to do is to use the right tool in the right place in the right way in order to not only be safe but be effective. And so the, the goal for this is to get there, you know, to make sure that you all are working as a community together uh, to find this comprehensive strategy and approach. And so before we begin, Mr. Mayor, if you don't mind, does anybody have any questions about process? So this is really about you being able to talk to your city council and the mayor and the city manager, you know, give your input. I'm available. I have no opinion tonight. I am the facilitator, which really 
takes all the heavy weight off me. Uh, but I, I am available. I'm not an expert in this, but I, I do have a lot of background. Uh, so if you have a question, I'm happy to, you know, if I can answer it, I will. If I can't, you know, we'll take that under advisement and we'll make sure we get answers. Uh, if I can't do it with my staff and the 23 scientists I have at the National Estuary Program, uh, then we'll, we'll go outside of that sphere of influence to try to get the technical information you need. Uh, so with that, uh, do any of the council members want to say anything before we move forward? Yeah, I, um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Recognizing me. There was an interesting article in the uh, Press Journal that I just wanted to read to the public because I thought it was very interesting. And um, it was a, uh, an article uh, about a um, Dr. Lisa Scioto, Executive Director of Marine Resources Council. And some of the things that she pointed out was um, that, that our big concern that we should be looking out for is that um, founded in uh, 1983, the Marine Resource Council is a nonprofit organization dedicated to saving the Indian River Lagoon. Its mission is to protect the lagoon through science, education, and restoration. Covering one third of Florida's east coast, the lagoon generates billions of dollars <coughs> to the region's economy through increased property values and tourism, she said. People are starting to realize that when our environment goes, our economy goes. Speaking uh, at a uh, club, she described some of the council's uh, activities, including mangrove restoration, marine debris removal, storm drain monitoring, lagoon literacy. She has a doctorate in conservation biology. She emphasized that the individual can do to help protect and restore the lagoon. These actions include follow local fertilizer ordinances, wean lawns off of all chemicals, landscape with native plants, keep grass clippings out of the street, use rain barrels, Pick up after the dogs. Avoid flushing unused medicines down the toilet. Take cars to car washes. And get political by voicing your concerns to your representatives and your legislators. And that's, that's really critical because if we work together as a community, we can have a plan where we can all benefit, live healthy, and our property values will not decrease and we won't have to be concerned about looking into our lagoon and getting sick. So I wanted to just read that. Uh, we all have a role to play in bringing the lagoon back to health, she stressed. So please, everybody get involved. Thank you. Other comments before we begin? Sure. Mr. Carla, comments? No, I just appreciate everybody coming here. We're looking forward to a very informative conversation with you all and any information you can provide so that we can come up with a plan that's gonna to work to bring our waterways um, into a condition that's, that we can all be proud of. So thank you. All right, now this is all about you. So if you raise your hand, I'll just recognize you. When you come to the podium, make sure you introduce yourself for the record. Uh, we are on TV and, uh, and, and the podium is yours. So who wants to start this off? Bob? Yes, Bob Steven at 150 Concha Drive, Sebastian. Thank you, gentlemen, for taking your time to be, do this. This is a great thing. We're really looking forward to this being, you know, the beginning of a new world. But I, I'd like to recommend right now that there be no more chemical controls managing the flow of water in the city of Sebastian. That should be a new thing. There are plenty of other ways of doing it. No more chemical controls to regulate the flow of water in the city of Sebastian. That, that's to start the meeting. And again, I can't thank you enough for being here. This is, this is a four-year dream of mine. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you, Bob. Doc. <coughs> Dwayne, you asked, oh, Graham Cox, 1213 George Street in Sebastian. Uh, Dwayne, you asked if there were some uh, process things that we'd like to address before we go to the actual meat and potatoes of this thing. Um, I've spent years doing public affairs stuff and running press meetings and whatever. And, and so my thinking has been, if it's gonna be a true forum, 
we might be better off having, you know, for the next meeting, having a circle of chairs so that we can see who's behind and who's, who yeah. wants to say things. I thought we would have a lot more people. Yeah, I realize. Yeah. <laughs> but, I, you know, if, if it is possible at least to get a, a, a circle of things so we can see each other and see who is here and see who, what comments we've got. Otherwise, I feel like I've got everybody behind me, and, uh, and that's it. Uh, yeah. I've shared uh, with, uh, with the Mayor and with uh, Mr. Carlisle a sort of a 10-point list of end results that I'd like to see uh, from, from this meeting. And I, I haven't heard them scream, no way, no how, no, no way it's going to happen. So I want to just go through quickly those 10 things. Um, some of them relate to process, some relate to, to, to substance. Uh, and so let me just do those. Uh, we're talking about three different habitats, uh, the golf course, the parks, and the canal system. And I've been you know, harping on this whole idea of integrated pest management plan. Now realize that we're talking plans, integrated pest management plans for the golf course, for the park system, and for the canal. It's a lot more work than doing a plan for one thing, but I'd, I'd like to say you really can't do an integrated pest management plan for the whole caboodle all in one thing. I think it's better off that we split it up and have three things there. We need an ecological survey to identify the invasion, invasives and the good plants, and this will ex establish a, uh, an eco ecological baseline. And I'm going to suggest this, and I, I've suggested it to the manager that a small grant application to a thing called the Lagoon Council uh, might be a useful thing there, $5,000 grants or up to 5000 in order to pay for an ecological survey. Uh, I know that the timeline, it takes a little while to get grants together and get them approved or whatever else, um, but I see that as a very useful basis. If we're going to do uh, uh, changes to the environment, let's know what, the, what we're doing first or what, what it is we're walking on and moving dirt on. My third bullet point is that we need an education program, and nobody's said no, we don't. Um, but it's got to be one that lasts because the whole function of this uh, forum is to say uh, people need to know more, and we want their ideas. Well, they they, they won't give the, your ideas unless they understand what it is that the, the issues are. And I I would really say we need an education program. Um, it struck me, I, the, the press journal is getting a lot, lot of publicity here. Um, at a meeting I was at last week down in the Indian River Neighborhood Association, the people from the city planning department uh, with their consultant came along and explained what they're going to do and what they're already doing uh, to get people's feedback on what to do with that uh, power plant site. They set up a website uh, and told people where to go and put their comments uh, on this website. And so far they've had, according to this story, 6,500 people have commented. Uh, it might be overwhelming, we might get 100 comments, but it might be worthwhile setting up a website and inviting people to comment uh, and set a, a reasonable deadline that for people to comment, not just to leave it so open-ended. But they're anticipating something like 15,000 people to comment by the time they finish this. Uh, and I, you know, just there's, there's more to it than setting up the website, but that's the first step to do that. Excuse me. Can you sure tell us do. what the website is? Their website is. Um, Damien, my eyes are all. That's okay. Goofy here, but I'll I'll come back to it in a second. That's fine. I'm sorry. It's www something, and I should have no outlined. www dot speakupverobeach dot com www.speakupverobeach.com. Thank you. Uh, next on the list, a citizen advisory committee made up of stakeholders, residents, golfers. And it might be that you want three different committees. God forbid that we provide, um, promote uh, more and more committees, but uh, uh, I have a f suspicion that the golfers might want to have their own say in things and the residents might want to have their own say in things. Uh, it will be a working committee. It could be under the umbrella of the Natural Resources uh, Board. And the thing that concerns me is to get information to you 
given the, the restrictions of the sunshine laws, uh, it might be difficult to structure a thing, uh, essentially the Natural Resources Board, to be the advisory committee on this when you want to include other people in the discussion and they, I, I could just see some confusion in the whole sunshine law business by doing, by doing it that way. A clear, the next one, a, a clear list of alternatives complete with the pros and cons and dollar and non-dollar health environment costs. And I know Mr. Carlisle is, uh, is in his own presentation has said uh, that we need the, the alternatives and we need the pros and cons of all those things. I, I think that's the logical way to go in any kind of planning. If needed, and I know we've we've gone around, is, is there going to be a referendum or is not going to be a referendum? But if there is, uh, besides the education program that I've suggested, uh, we need an education campaign to support, if there's a referendum, to support a referendum. People don't just vote yes for referendums to raise their taxes without a, a real campaign to get them to understand what it is uh, that, they, that they're being asked to pay for. Uh, my next item is this, um, a clear definition of the role of the City Council in doing this. I know you're the deciders, but getting information to you is, is um, I think, something of a challenge. We've got to make sure that you do get it, and you do get to hear from everybody, and they feel that they're getting their information to you. Uh, i got to say that sometimes when you're all sitting up here on the dais, uh, it's somewhat intimidating to step forward and say, Here's what I think you should do, because uh, then you get uh, sort of into, a, into an interrogation system and most folks go, oh, I don't want to do that. Here's an expensive item. Uh, hire an environmental manager, a manager with authority to produce the three distinct uh, integrated pest management plants. You may have somebody on staff that you can appoint. Uh, or you may have to go looking for a consultant or you hire a manager. But I think, uh, frankly, uh, you know, the, the city manager's got enough on his plate without dumping all this on him and saying, now fix this one. Uh, you might need to have an environmental manager whose sole job is to focus on this and get on with it. Almost to the end here. I, I, I live across from the Stormwater Park on Angler. Uh, I'm over there frequently and I walk over there. It's beautiful. I love it. Um, but it's, since the city took it over in 2008, it's really been in need of uh, some tender loving care uh, to make full use of the ponds and the wetlands to clean up the canal system. And we've had discussions in the past about how often do those pumps run and how much water goes through it. And if you run the pumps at full speed, will it suck all the water out of the canal? Um, I just think we've got to focus a little bit better, a little more on the management of that, that uh, stormwater park. My goal in all of this would be to say that we've got a goal and an action plan to make the canal system a natural resource asset to the city's green infrastructure, like the parks and the walking trails, the canoe and kayak access at Sebastian River, and the shores of the lagoon. Uh, it really is. Uh, the canal system really is an asset to this community. House prices, you, you go and look at house prices, the house prices are higher on the, when they back up to the canal uh, than away from the canal. Uh, people obviously see it to be an asset. Um, I have various thoughts about whether it really is when my three grandkids were dared to jump into the canal and swim and they came out and it took, them, took three days to get the stink out of them. Uh, so, so with that, I... I that's my sort of sh short list of things, and I'd be delighted to answer any questions and take part in all the rest of the discussion here. Thank you, Dwayne. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Dr. Cox. Uh, somebody else would like to speak, and also, um, you should all be willing to and open to respond to what you hear with other speakers. So if something resonates with you that you maybe not have thought about before you came in, by all means, let the council know that, you know, gosh, this idea sounded like, you know, a really good idea. So don't hesitate. Uh, we want as many of you to feed into this conversation uh, as you are comfortable. So please. Come on up. My name is Julia Held. I'm a teacher and um, 
a mother. I have a child who's gone through the school system here. He's in high school now. And I really do represent the mothers in our community. Um, our children play in, in our city areas. We play in the lagoon. We're actually in it, you know. We are the consumers of the environment here. Um, and I think it's super important that we maintain its environmental integrity and the safety of it. And I'm super excited that this is even coming you know, in the forefront that we're thinking about revamping how we manage these areas because um, research shows that these things aren't good. And it's one thing when we have, we're kind of at a crux here in this community. There's a lot of growth and I understand that there's a lot of money that comes in with the growth and I would really like to see that money be used to to maintain the integrity, environmental integrity of this area. Because if we don't, we're gonna lose it. Um, and making changes here with with some of these things is, is just the forefront of it. I mean, there's a lot of work to do, and we've done a lot of work already. I've served on multiple boards and been in multiple capacities um, cleaning up the lagoon, the parks, the ocean, um, you know, getting plastics out. I mean, I, I've kind of got my hands in a lot of different things. So, um, but I'm excited about the movement forward and I really just want us to, money's not the bottom line here. It's going to take money. It is going to take switching some things around so that, um, that's not the bottom line. We're not going with the cheapest, easiest solution because that's not the environmentally sound one. You know, let's find something, a variety of practices that can keep it aesthetically pleasing, um, but also um, safe, you know, for our children, their children, um, because I, we have a beautiful area and it's real, this, like I said, right now, you know, this is it. This is our time to make some consequential decisions about what it's going to look like in five years and ten years. And um, we want our wildlife. You know, we did the whole Indian River Lagoon. Um, the Marine Resources Council put out a few years ago an intensive booklet as to the quality of the lagoon. Um, it based on the quality of it here and there and you know across it we have like the best spot we have the healthiest spot um, and you can go ahead and look at the document it's two years old I think um, but the animals come here my, my husband's a commercial fisherman and so he does see it and this is the we've got it all you know, and if we chase them away or kill them off with too many chemicals, they're not coming back. Um, and there's nowhere else to go, really. You know, I think we're all doing a good job. I just want us to see us do more. And I know we're just the city of Sebastian, but we can make a difference. And um, I'm here to help with whatever I can do in that capacity. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Bob, I'm going to hold you for a minute and kind of go around the room, sure. and, and then I'll get you back to the mic, if you don't mind. No, absolutely. Uh, unless it's a really burning issue. Okay. I want to give Graham an edible. All right. <laughs> you know, he does such a good job. He's Come on up. <clears throat> I'm Bob Masterson. I live at 106 Blue Heron Way. Uh, I have a question for regarding one of uh, Dr. Cox's uh, bullets regarding the ecological survey. He says we need to do one of good plants. Is there not such a survey already existing? Maybe not specifically to Sebastian canals, but in general? Uh, are, we, are we talking about going back to square one? For that, and the second question I have, and, and what percentage of contribution of bad things does Sebastian City provide to the Indian River Lagoon? So we have some idea. Uh, I'm a day sailor here in the lagoon. I'm on the water a lot, um, so I'm very interested in this, obviously. But uh, we just like to know what contribution we actually make. Thank you. Now, I think I'm going to jump in and try to answer that question if I could, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but if you're going to do a integrated 
pest management plan. You know, those kinds of surveys are going to be very specific to the locations and areas that you're managing. And, and that general information probably is not out there at the detail that you would need to do the plan. But no, we're not starting from scratch because thankfully there's been, you know, botanists and naturalists and environmentalists and, you know, especially some of your, your city properties. You know, I'm sure there's data out there, uh, but it hasn't been assembled with this use in mind. So it is going to take, you know, looking at what's available, bringing it together, seeing where the gaps are, and then developing a plan. Uh, would that be a, a, a correct statement? Yes, and there's some other nuances to that as well. So in areas where if council determines that we're going to do the excavation and dredging to reestablish the canals, doing a study there may not be the best spending of the dollars because the majority of that stuff may be removed with the, with the dredging to remove those sediment and those historical uh, nutrient loads and then we can manage what, what comes back or what we plant. So it's gonna be specific to what's gonna, what we decide as a group, where we're gonna be applicable for the solutions that we use. If we do dredge and we do littorial shelves, that's gonna be a new ecosystem. It's gonna be developed with the best plants and things available to help with the water quality. So this is why we're looking at this overall program. It's not one size fits all. Every area, as uh, Dr. Cox said, is different. The golf course is different. The canal system's different. The neighborhood parks are different. In fact, the ball fields are different. So every area is going to have to be treated in its own little um, system, if that makes sense. Great. And the second question, I get asked that all the time, and, and you're not going to like my answer, but it, it's an honest answer. When you look at this, you know, what percentage do I contribute? And let's take it from the individual. Uh, you know, an individual home, that percentage may be very, very minuscule, and then you add it by 1.6 million residents along the Indian River Lagoon and it becomes significant. So you all are very lucky to be in Indian River County and very lucky to be here in the city of Sebastian because it's true, this particular segment of the lagoon uh, has higher water quality. A lot of it relates to the growth that's happened. You, you are not as, you know, as high a density of population as areas of Brevard, you know, with commercial industrial uses. Uh, you've got, you know, some relatively, you know, decent flow coming through Sebastian River or Sebastian Inlet, even though it's, it's still somewhat limited. So if you look at the projections of growth for the lagoon over the next 20 to 30 years, the two fastest growing counties right now are projected to be Indian River County and St. Lucie County. And it's because you've got so much, you know, land that used to be in ag that's converting to residential. And so I think the, the real answer to that question, it's not so much where you are right at the moment, but you wanna have really best management practices because you're gonna continue to grow. And if there are effective ways to decrease your footprint, whether it's nutrients or chemicals or, you know, shoreline destabilization, everybody's got a responsibility to do what they can, which is why I'm so pleased to be here to see the city of Sebastian having this discussion. And, and other small communities like Oak Hill up in Volusia County are, are having very similar. So you do what you can with the footprint that you have within your community. And you know, if everybody did it at the small level, I wouldn't be, I could retire. I wouldn't have the problem I have at the big level. So I can't tell you what percentage, but right now the city of Sebastian compared to other places is relatively small, but not insignificant when you think about 38 incorporated cities, 1.6 million residents, and I saw the numbers two days ago. We're averaging between 850 uh, to 1,000 people a day coming into the state of Florida. So we've gone back to the pre-recession influx of population. Next question. Come on in, Diane. Hello. Thank you for having this workshop. I really appreciate it. We all appreciate it. 
I'm Diana Bolton. I live on George Street. I'm an environmental science researcher and a 100-ton master boat captain, and I have a degree in environmental marine science. Um, I agree with everything that uh, Dr. DeFries said, Dr. Cox said, Bob, and all the other speakers. We've got some great um, talent here. So I'll just go over some quick points. Some of them are a little bit redundant, but a little different. Um, on the stormwater parks, uh, I think it might be a possibility that I, I toured the Osprey Stormwater Park two days ago in, in South Vero on Oslo Road that they've just opened up. It's incredible. It's like night and day compared to our stormwater park. They've used plants. They're using plants as biofilters and they're using even, even water lettuce as a biofilter. They've got a whole different approach than what we have here. Um, we have real potential. That park is gorgeous, 166 acres and five ponds. And we can use these plants, instead of seeing them as enemies, see them as our friends. And they're, in fact, very effective natural biofilters of the water and work more cheaply and effectively as we're spending money to kill everything and the green plants and the bugs and the insects and the fish, we could be using these plants to work for us. Um, I also, um, another point is on, I've been looking at our stormwater ordinance and our setbacks on our fertilizer ordinance, which is excellent. That, that was pushed through a few years ago. But what we need to have on there and what is devoid is we don't have any, uh, there's no mention of pesticides on there, pesticides or herbicides. As we have setbacks on fertilizers, we should have those same setbacks for our pesticides and herbicides. If we do that, we will then be in, in uh, concert with our stormwater ordinance, which specifically states that we're not allowed to spray any chemicals that can drain in any ditches or ponds or swales and lead into our water system or Indian River or the ocean. So um, it could be done with a simple um, amendment as opposed to creating a whole new ordinance we could actually just amend our existing fertilizer ordinance to include the verbiage of pesticides and um, herbicides. And that way, we don't have to create a whole new ordinance. We could just add that verbiage onto our existing one. Um, water testing, it would be good to see more water testing done. I'm sure that there's grant money available. And in doing so, we could see where our source point pollution is and where our hot spots are. Um, Orca is doing a good job on that up in Vero Beach. And so by identifying the red zones versus the blue zones, we can see where we're being successful and where we need a little more work. And we can identify where that pollution is coming from and zero in on those areas. As was mentioned earlier, we do have a lot of very, uh, we are in a green zone compared to our neighbors to the north and the south. They're in the red, we're in the green. A lot of it's because we have the Sebastian Inlet here. So we want to protect that. It's much easier to protect it rather than go backwards and try to undo what's already been done. Um, prevention is a lot better than a cure. As far as the municipal golf course goes, um, I have sent information out to all the council members and the mayor and to uh, the golf course superintendent reference the Audubon International Certified Certification which is only $300 a year, and it, uh, is, it actually saves money in the long run. I read the testimonials, and I went through the website, and I also spoke to the representative for the Audubon International, and um, which is not the same as the Audubon group here. They're, it's a separate entity. But what they do is they encourage using pesticides only when necessary in spot treating as opposed to doing wholesale blanketing and also a conditioning of the soil. It's a six step process. It's very easy to get certified. Some of uh, golf courses have done it in only six months. Some have taken a year. Um, if there's extra funding needed for the plantings around the water bodies that help filter the extra chemicals that are needed on a golf course, um, we can probably help get some grant money for that, some funding to help do that, because in the end, that's going to help us tremendously. That water probably seeps out and flows into the Collier Creek, which flows into the St. Sebastian River, which flows into the Indian River Lagoon. So I'm sure that's a hot spot, and we need to really address that. Also, it would be safer for the golfers and for the people that work there. And as our golf course, municipal golf course, is operating as a, at a deficit, it might help encourage more people like me to take up golf, because I would be happy to if I thought I wasn't going to be exposed to too many chemicals. 
So um, <clears throat> education to the public, yes, we need to get everybody on board. We can't expect a municipality to do something if we aren't doing it ourselves. So we all have to work hand in hand here. We can't blame each other. We all need to work together, as Dr. DeFries said. And our stormwater ordinance is a very good ordinance. We need to enforce it. It is not being enforced. It needs to be read, and it needs to be enforced by our code enforcement people. <clears throat> as far as testing new products go, uh, we need to do baseline studies for areas that, when, and this was brought up the other night during city council, as far as testing new um, chemical products, we need to do a baseline study. Even if they seem fairly inert and um, unharmful, we need to at least do a baseline study. It's not just about the surface and what the green leaves are on, on the surface. There's also the main area, which you can't see, which is the water area where the fish are. And then there's the insects and the benthic layer underneath, which is the base of our food chain. So um, first of all, we need to take a look at what invasives really are and what is an invasive. Some of the things that were mentioned, like cattails and spatter dock, are not invasives, they're native plants. And how do you spray without, uh, or treat without killing uh, the natives that you don't want to kill? If we do remove invasives, anything else will come in its place, including more invasives. So we also need to be prepared to replant and replace in that space, because any time you have a space, it's going to be taken over by something else. It could be desirable, it could be undesirable, but that's something that needs to be taken into consideration. This wholesale thing about killing invasives, but without, and with the unintended consequences of poisoning the soil in the meantime, or leaving an open space where another species that you may not desire takes the place of that, so that needs to be considered as well. Do you have, does anyone have any questions? If I may, yes, sir. Bolton, the one thing I, that I want to bring it to attention is the, the, and I don't disagree with you that we should try to regulate the pesticides. The problem is that we're preempted by the state. So you need to talk to the legislatures because Florida statute 487, 482 preempt the regulation of pesticides to the state. So though we, would, we may want to do that, we are currently preempted by the state from being able to add that into our stormwater ordinance and our fertilizer ordinance. So that's, a, that's something we need to, to talk to the state about. We're not preempted. Um, I'm, I'm aware of that, and we are working on that on the state level. But we are not preempted from um, putting a setback requirement. We are preempted from totally not allowing private homeowners to use those chemicals. We are able to, as a municipality, fund or not fund those chemicals and use them or not use them, but we are not preempted by our state law to uh, choose not to use poisons, and we are not preempted. Uh, we are able to have that in our setback requirement. What we cannot do by state law at this point, because of the preemptive law, is we are not allowed to ban private homeowners from using whatever poisons they want in their own yard. But what we can do, and we can regulate this legally, is we can regulate the distance from where it goes into the water. Like, for example, if you're spraying on a slope, which most of us have slopes and ditches in our yards because that's the drainage culture of Sebastian, everybody knows there's gravity, and some of the best sod I have and the best fertilized sod I have is the stuff that's getting all the fertilizer from downstream from my neighbors, upstream from my neighbors, and every year I can cut out beautiful sod out of the middle of my quarter round because it's been fertilized by everything up. up. So as we know, anything that's sprinkled or sprayed or scattered will drain down into that ditch. So it's not impractical and, and it makes a lot of sense to include the pesticides and the um, uh, herbicides in that fertilizer ordinance that we have and it does not um, violate any preemptive law with the state of Florida, as I understand it. And you may have to get some more legal advice on that, but that's my understanding, sir. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you Diane. Thank you. Who else would uh, like to speak? Come on up. Hi, good evening. Uh, Tim Glover with the uh, president of the Friends of St. Sebastian River. I also would like to thank you for this venue. Um, I think it's important. Um, as Graham mentioned, uh, education I think is going to be a big part of it. This is a, a nice first step. 
Um, the website's an idea too. Um, as part of that education, I think it would be important probably for the citizens to understand what the issues are and, and why the city has taken in the past, either in the past or in the future, what steps that they intend to take uh, to address those issues so that they understand you know, a cause and effect and a, a cause and reason for addressing them. Um, Stormwater is part of the issue, and, I, and the part of the education on that, too. Um, Indian River County did a test I, several years ago, I think it was with Dr. Grant Gilmore, to try to determine how quickly stormwater would get to the lagoon. And they, you know, they put that rubber ducky in the canal or whatever, and it, I think it was only a matter of a couple hours, and it ended up in the lagoon. So, um, you know, that's, that's a, an important connection people need to make. Some communities put those markers on the storm drain saying, you know, all canals or waterways and what have you lead to the lagoon. Um, there's some signs posted around. So that's part of the education process, too. So there's a lot that can be done, I think, that would really help. It would help the community, I think, understand what the issues are and what you're trying to accomplish and, and perhaps give some buy-in, too, and support for uh, trying to improve things by just cleaning up their own yards, for example. Um, the other thing is, I would imagine that there may be some funding out there available. Um, long term, the, of course, the goal would be to get the Indian River cleaned up, and, and as I just pointed out, all waterways lead to the lagoon. Um, if things are not successful locally here, there may be mandates coming from the state or federal government, and I presume there would probably be some funding to help out to try to avoid things like that. So I don't know if that's an issue. I'm sure you probably have a better finger on that than most anybody. So. All right, great, thanks. Thank you, Tim. Thanks, Tim. Uh, yes, there is funding. Um, not only do we have funding, but most of the state agencies. The key is, as a city, I think the city needs to decide how you want to move forward, what you need, and then you kind of target that need to those funding sources. Uh, but there is a, a lot of money out there. It's not easy to get. It's very competitive. Uh, but no question, there's a point once think the city council kind of has a sense of where they want to go then you know I'm very happy to assist uh, the city in any way we can to, to help you all in in finding those sources and in in the next cycle even even our sources who else wants to speak don't be shy come on up we'll start here and then over here Hi, my name, my name is Charles Stadelman. Um, speaking today just strictly as a citizen, not part of the board or anything like that, just to make that clear. Um, coming today just to give ideas on uh, aquatic weed control. Uh, mostly what I've been looking at is a mechanical means of weed control. Uh, that would include floating um, machines basically that are both um, diesel powered or gas powered um, these machines run up to about 80 to 125 thousand uh, dollars just for the machine and that's just on some of the machines I've looked at and so I was wondering if we're looking ahead in our budget as we go into our comp plans for either purchasing these machines outright for um, direct mechanical removal of the weeds as opposed to um, simply spraying. Uh, I, I do like a combination of everything we have out there um, and, I, and I'm greatly appreciative of, of these workshops that we're holding. But these machines are, would require um, probably a, a new class of employee at the city if we were to do it ourselves because um, you're looking at buying the equipment, hundreds of thousands of dollars of that, training uh, new employees at the city to operate these machines safely, as well as um, logistics of removal of the um, debris and getting the machines in and out on a timely basis, as well as uh, a cost for how many years you're gonna be using this, which is probably for as long as we have the canals. Um, so you're looking at about, Eighty to one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars for basic machinery, um, fifty to sixty-five thousand dollars per um, mechanical user or operator. Uh, that's just generally a, a pay scale of what these people make, and that's just one machine with one person using it. 
And that's a mechanical means, which means you're always going to be basically pulling weeds with a machine. It doesn't end. So um, you'll pull the weeds this year. Also, everything else that goes along with the weeds, um, other whatever plants and animals that you're trying to avoid. Um, I wanted to come here mostly with numbers and things, not just saying we have a problem or something like that. Um, the other way we can look at it too is um, it increases the value of our city, not only just Sebastian, because as beautiful as Sebastian is, we're not alone in this state. Um, we have neighbors through everywhere. Um, down south is Vero Beach, up north is Palm Bay and um, out west, Yeeal Junction, Kenansville, and um, onward to everything that's out there. So we have to look at what we do here, how it also affects everybody else around here. If we can raise the, um, the value of our city, that helps with one of our number one goals with sustainable development, which is helping to erase poverty um, by raising the value of everything here, it makes it worth something for people to come here. Um, it, they may, people may not want spraying, but because we live in a modern day society where you can mechanically pull out all the weeds, you can have as many people out there as you want pulling, you can have the goats out there too, but I think you're still going to have a combination, just a, um, a thought out way of using it, not just spraying it. Um, some of the other things that it affects too when you're just pulling weeds like that, um, it, it, it affects everything as far as the good health and well-being of the whole area. By not putting so much spray into the system, you may uh, or may not, depending on your uh, point of view on that, really affect the health and well-being of those who are live closest to these canals. I personally live right on the canal. Um, I've, I've had the guy with the boat come up and spray right along. and myself and my daughter enjoy going down to the canal side and you know seeing whatever we see in there so we've always seen them spray responsibly I personally don't have a problem with the way they've been spraying but I've been around it all my life um, he's always sprayed into the grass before the rains come and I really haven't seen him spray directly into the water just on the sides where the weeds and everything grow in so I haven't seen that type of spraying where they where he sprayed right into the water um, but beyond that, a lot of it, <clears throat> you may um, employ um, a system where people can opt out of the spraying altogether, where they can, I'll take care of it myself. This little piece of canal, um, when you look at the, um, I think it's rhetorical rights, you go really like halfway into the water usually, uh, but it may just go down to where the water starts. But they can opt in and somehow you can put up a marker where it lets the person spraying know not to spray in this area. But they would also have to be responsible for them taking care of their little part. Much like how we do um, water lines and the asphalt paving of the roads. Um, those are just a couple things with the machinery, mechanical uh, removal, and just an opt out for each individual so that they could take care of it themselves. Obviously, with um, ways of making sure if they don't take care of it, the city is able to come back in. Um, a lot of the uh, what we're doing with these workshops address a lot of the sustainable development goals. Um, we're, we're looking at spraying in the water, so that really affects life below water, including the fish, the plants, um, other microorganisms that live there. We're looking at life above on land as we're spraying for the grass and such like that. It affects how our health and well-being. But it also, we work with um, other governmental agencies and all this. So there's a lot of, a lot of what we're doing fits right into our sustainable development goals and things like this, partnerships and, um, and working with different agencies like the Indian River Council or perhaps the St. John's Water Management District. All of this comes into play with our overall development of sustainable development and those sustainable development goals over the next 10 years. And um, really, that's all I really want to talk about was the mechanical removing and maybe an option for the people who live there, particularly to put up a marker and say, I'm going to be responsible for this little piece of land and I'll take care of it as I see fit, if that's possible. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Yes, I'm Dr. Bob Betta. I'm a volunteer on the Natural Resources Board here in town. And uh, 
I think a couple things that we need to focus on as basic mantras, if you will, that uh, anything we do be uh, non-toxic and biodegradable in nature. All right, so uh, that'd be one of the thrusts. Another thrust should be that we uh, do things to decrease the nutrient load in our waters, the nutrification. And fertilizers are a big part of it, and so are septic tanks and runoff from different things. The third one escapes me right now. <laughs> but uh, those two basic ones are, are very, very important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just do a plug for the septic systems? The city currently for the CRA district has a grant, a cost share grant for converting septic to sewer for the CRA district. We've got several coming on the meeting, this, uh, this upcoming meeting, but we need the residents to apply, or the business owners and residents to apply. We got a grant from the Indian River Lagoon Council to help offset those costs. The money's available. And just want everybody to understand that the Indian River County had waived the fee, the, the, um, one of the fees for the ERUs, and that's coming to an end. And I think we need to get the message out to our businesses and residents in the CRA where they can connect. We've got a 75, 25% cost share. The city pays 75, and 25 is the, the business owner or resident. So it's a very good program. We're one of the only ones doing it, and it's, it's, it's a shame that these individuals aren't applying. So get the word out. I appreciate that. Thank you. Next speaker. Oh, you guys are shy tonight. Bob, I'm going to let you take the mic. I didn't forget you. I want to thank Dr. Cox because <clears throat> we've been working on this four years, and he is, he, he's, he's, he's done his homework on this, you guys. Listen to the old man. He, he is really great. And uh, <clears throat> we're, missing, we're missing one or two little things here. Uh, we should be transparent with the permit that, that allows us to spray these, these toxic chemicals because the permit is very clear, and I think that should be readily available to the public, and it's not. We should know what you're spraying my backyard with, when you're spraying it. The last six, 62 days ago, we got sprayed with a, cocktail, con, uh, a cocktail that would knock the socks off of a healthy kid. And it, was, it mixed Diquat 2,4-D with glyphosate and five or six other chemicals. And nobody tests all those chemicals together. You know that, Dwayne. So we need to know when that happens. And the permit says we're supposed to know. The permit says the city is supposed to tell us when you're going to poison my backyard. You're supposed to tell us what you're poisoning it with. It shouldn't be secret. This is a no-brainer. And this is, this, this is a crime against humanity in my, word, my mind. And the other thing is, uh, 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 Dr. Bob, I think maybe your, your, your last thing was, was the carbon footprint. I mean, let's look at our carbon footprint here. We, we're not even looking at our car. We have, we have vehicles idling all day long here. You know, I have city vehicles, the old war out diesels that sit there idling for eight hours. Insanity. The new cars come through and they shut themselves off at idle. Clean running cars. Why would you let a worn out diesel sit here and idle? I mean, Honda has offered us money to help the, the fishermen clean up their, their carbon footprint on the waterways. But I can't get past this poison thing. You know, I'm dying from this stuff and I just gotta leave, I think. I'm not gonna take on another project and I'm just gonna leave. That's what I'm gonna have to do, you know. You know, I like what everybody's saying here, but. We need, we need to look at that permit, please. The boat should be leaded up. There should be a phone number we can call them and say, what are you spraying on my backyard, please? You know, the dog next door is dead. The old lady next to me just lost her mind. And they're out there adjusting their sprinklers. And on the Diquat 24D, it said, don't use for irrigation. I ran over the guy next door. He's out there adjusting his sprinkler. I said, they just put Diquat 24D and seven or other chemicals in your water. Don't get out of there. I got three or four guys dead. I got cysts on dogs up and down my canal. Come on, people. Read the MSDS sheets. Read the permits. We had a clever city manager at one time, and he says, oh, we don't have to follow the permit. We, we, we're, we're not public waterways. 
in my backyard. It's in my backyard. Bob, I, think, I, you've ma I think you've made your point. Do you, Thank uh, you, do you have any other points? Yeah, round table next time so we can <laughs> put this stuff together. Thank you. We can do this. Come on. Number three came to you. Number three came to me. You can thank Bob for that. <laughs> well, it, it is as follows. Uh, we have to, as Ms. Bolton said, uh, uh, re-examine what we call invasive plants. Uh, many of these plants are native to Florida, and plants are an important biofilter. I know this, and anybody who's ever studied marine biology or oceanography knows that the wetlands uh, perform a great function. And those wetlands are full of plants, and those plants are biofilters. And we need plants to clean the water. So if we eradicate the plants, we, we shoot ourselves in both feet. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bennett. Graham? Am I missing somebody? Abedia. Sorry, Dr. Abedia. I thought uh, I you got your last name wrong. Right Thanks. Go ahead, Graham. Round two. Uh, the gentleman may, uh, who came up earlier mentioned, uh, is there a way we can notify the plant aquatics or whoever's coming by with a spray thing not to spray in my yard? Bob has don't spray signs. Uh, what, 10 bucks a piece? No. I'm not sure where the plant. 20. 20? <laughs> a gift from friends if, yeah. if you need it, you're on the canal. Uh, so there are signs to be able to put out there if you want them to stop spraying as they go by, you can do that. Uh, I once had a conversation with a fellow on the, on the uh, airboat uh, who beseeched me not to uh, put up these signs uh, because he said he would lose his job. And I reassured him that we didn't want people losing their jobs over this. We just wanted a more scientific approach as I, as I saw it at the time. Ecological survey, I will uh, volunteer to the manager, to the, to the mayor, to find out what is available in terms of ecological survey stuff for, for Sebastian. And I think it's gonna be tied in with whatever the county has got. My authority for both of those, uh, for, for this is gonna be uh, my namesake, Dr. David Cox, who is a biology consultant in town. And Paul, I'll make sure you get his uh, contact information. I hated to give it to you without him agreeing to phone numbers and, and emails out. Uh, but I think there's the material there. Let's pull it together. I'll find out where I can track it down and, and put it into one spot. Uh, education, uh, I talked earlier to, uh, to Mr. Carlisle about taking the presentation that he gave uh, at the December 12th meeting and boiling down 45 minutes to 15 minutes. And I think, Paul, you, you said it's a, it's a useful thing to try to do. I know it takes a lot of work on somebody's part, uh, but it, I think that should be up running constantly uh, to, so people get, get to know what the issues are, what the, where's the thinking on this, uh, on this issue. And so if you need help producing a script for that or editing through that, I'll be happy to do it. Integrated pest management plan. I see up on the screen here we've got an integrated pest management workshop, but no, it's actually dis defined integrated pest management uh, to the satisfaction of the group. My Bible is this book that we got from the IFAS people. Dr. Haller sent it to me three, four years ago. And it's the one that tells you what chemicals are available, why chemicals, what plants, uh, what invasives, and how you go about identifying all these things and putting two and two together to make sense in an integrated pest management plant. So Appendix D of this report uh, is how to develop, an, a lake, or in this case, a lake, but it could be a river or a lagoon, a, a management plan. And it goes through the, the steps and the elements in it. Uh, developing the plan, you need to focus on the prevention program. And basic to that is education and a quantity uh, Quantitative combined with proactive management of new infestation, but key to the prevention is education. Uh, the next step in that is problem assessment. Uh, should focus on identifying a problem in a given water body and collecting information about the problem. And we've said this all along, if you don't know what the problem is, you have no idea what solutions are, are gonna be there. Project management, uh, that's part of the integrated pest management plan. It's a neglected aspect of managing invasive plants, according to the uh, IFAS people. 
monitoring. You've got to have a monitoring program that uh, uh, should include not only an assessment of the distribution of target plant species, but also a program to monitor other biological communities. That gets back to this ecological survey business. Uh, education and outreach, separate from, I think, the, the prevention discussion, there's going to be an education and outreach pr program that goes along with everything you're going to do. It's not something you're going to do this week or next week or the week after. It's something you're going to do for one year, two years, five years. Uh, you're going to keep moving along with the program so people understand what you Because people sell houses and people buy houses, and they don't know uh, what's preceded on that particular piece of property. Uh, plant information and methods. Uh, you need to have a, a good list of invasives, non-native, native, native uh, endangered, and threatened species. And uh, the, you're going to articulate management goals, uh, and there's going to be site-specific management, and last but no means least, uh, an evaluation period. Is it working? Um, is all this effort that you're putting into this working? Are we better off now than, than we were when we started? And if it helps, I'll give this to Jeanette uh, to put into the uh, into the record of this thing, and I can give you more copies. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I don't have any more come up beyond comments beyond that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Graham. Anybody else? Come on back up. Still Bob Masterson. Um, in a way, I've only been here for two years in Sebastian. I uh, love it already. But um, I think in a way we're fortunate in that we do not have any really big industrial type contamination, chlorinated hydrocarbons, those kind of things. It's just mostly agricultural and related. So in a way we're fortunate that we have somewhat limited contaminants to really deal with. Uh, I would like to take exception to what Dr. I believe Bennett proposed, and that is categorically saying no toxic, no nothing that's not biodegradable. I think, as the gentleman here said, I think there's a lot to be said for combining approaches that risk assessments or, or needed. I think your idea of doing localized uh, surveys of what the issues are in particular locations so that when you try to remediate it, you're dealing with those particular issues rather than just carte blanche. I think that's where we're going to get in trouble, trying to apply one standard to every location. The other thing I'd like to ask about something that uh, Ms. Bolton mentioned. Um, city Manager, are we not enforcing our stormwater regulations? She said very strongly that we're not. What, what is the situation there, if you would? Well, I don't know exactly what area she's saying we're not enforcing. There, there are areas that we enforce with drainage and things of that nature. Um, I believe, and I don't want to speak for her, but there's some concern over how people are fertilizing and how they're doing things. We can't be everywhere, but you know we do the best we can with the two code officers we have, and so there's always room for improvement. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna wait a second to see, you know, if a question pops up. How many questions do I get? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think you've had yours. I'd like to rebut that last statement. <laughs> then please come up before we uh, turn it back to the mayor. And you know, when Bob Stephen 150 Concha Drive. You know, they you know when Joe Griffin left, he said, "Well, I'm going to double the stormwater fee." So that's I don't know three something million dollars a year. And he sent some guys in vans and they weed whacked my canal. And I went, "Oh, thank God," because it was just you know, hard to do. And when I first moved here, they said, oh, you got to do your own canals. you got to do your own stuff. I said, okay. And they did it for a month. Then they left, and I've never been back. So I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Carlisle, you're not doing much of your stormwater business, but I think any of my neighborhoods. That Thank wasn't you. the question. The question was whether we were enforcing our ordinance, not whether we were doing everything everybody expected of us. 
Can I well, kind of managing stormwater, right? At the beginning, of the, at the beginning, I think Dr. Cox said we're going to be polite. We're going to be this. Okay. We're going to be this. I'd just like to ask you to not do that type stuff. Uh, I'm sorry. It it's not productive. It really. Okay, is. I'll, I'll all, try to restate it. We all know we want to solve this problem, and it's not productive to be that challenging. And you stated that last meeting, and I'm sorry for that. You yes. know, I'll try not to use names and, and attack. You. But I don't see we're doing a whole lot right, Mr. Mayor. Well, I, I, that's your opinion, and yeah, I, I appreciate your opinion, and you have the right to do that. But it's not necessarily productive right. to constantly sorry about say that. to the city manager, you're not doing your job, or, to, you know, I, I'll go back to the concept in one, one council meeting, uh, I was called a baby killer by someone. I haven't been called a baby killer t since the last time I walked through an airport in Seattle with a uniform on when I came back from Vietnam a second time. <clears throat> and it, it's not productive to be that way. And I, I appreciate you have your, have your opinions and you're certainly welcome, but try to taint the way you do that so okay. it's, it, it is more productive. I'm just learning. You know, I'm an old uh, Boston City street kid, and then I, yeah, I, I, I was a I car know. mechanic. We went real smooth about <laughs> stuff. You're you fixed, better. You, you fixed really the are. car or you didn't fix the car. That was the bottom line, you <laughs> Mr. know. Mr. Mayor, I agree. He is getting better. Thank yeah. you, Bob. <laughs> Thank you, Dwayne. I try. <clears throat> no offense, Matt. I just, I'm a car mechanic. You do the job. You we, get the job done. Bob, period. we understand. Thank you. But it is uh, the mayor's comments, uh, you know, I serve seven counties, you know, 40% of the East Coast of Florida. And, and a, a lot of these issues can get very emotional. They can get very personal, especially when we talk about human health issues. And, and it is really good advice that, you know, when you're in these forums, you know, it's not about personal, it's about process, about policy. And it, it is way more effective to try to curb that enthusiasm and that emotion in order to get the job done. So uh, it's good advice, Mr. Mayor. Uh, anybody else before we uh, turn it over? Come on, Diane. I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, Mayor and Council people and City Manager and Dr. DeFries, thank you so much for what you're doing here. Thank you for being here. And I think we're headed in the right direction. And the town supports you, and we really appreciate what you're doing. Thank you. Dr. Bob. Uh, yes. Uh, so to elaborate, a non-toxic biodegradable approach can be multidimensional. It doesn't have to be just non-toxic biodegradable chemical compounds. It can be animals, such as goats, eating weeds and vegetation. It can be uh, controlled burn using diesel and other mechanisms. It can be steam. It can be a lot of things. But to use poison introduces poison into our environment. Do you want that for your children and grandchildren is what I ask. Thank you, sir. Well, with that, uh, one more. I'm Larry Mandel with um, Carnival Terrace. Um, just heard a lot of things about um, carbon footprints, footprints, footprints. If we have less feet in the county, that might solve a lot of the problems because humans are the problem. All of these problems are created by humans. So maybe if we have less feet and we can limit our growth, that would really go a long way in solving the problem. Thank you. One last moment. Going, going, guy. Graham, you're not done yet? Never done. We want to get it all out I, tonight while we can. I just, uh, Graham Cox, 1213 George Street. Uh, at the, in the manager's presentation to the council, he talked about a, uh, a, new, a new product that's out on the market uh, as a competitor to uh, glyphosate and Roundup, and it's called WOW, Whack Out Weeds. And I just want folks to know that, that that uh, looks to be a medical product, but we have no idea what medical products yeah, have in terms of side effect. But we can tell you what's in it. The company that makes it, Ecomite, uh, is concerned, and I've talked with the chief executive officer on this a couple of times, he's concerned because there are other products out there called WOW. And so he's redoing his website to be able to make sure that the stuff that he sells is, is the stuff that we're talking about. The main ingredients of, of, of WOW 
uh, it's uh, you know, it, it, it is, and I'll, I'll stop there. The main ingredients, the active ingredients are peppermint oil, potassium sorbate, sodium chloride, and that only constitutes about 11%. Most of it is water, soap, and potassium benzoate. Most of the things that are in it are food preservatives. Uh, I'm a little puzzled as to how food preservatives are effective when it comes to killing off vegetation, but that's uh, he's been extremely cooperative in terms of giving me information, sending me the sources for more information. And I know he's talked to the, to the manager about uh, stuff he's given us a deal, in fact, 20% off the price of, the, of a barrel of this stuff. Uh, but uh, when people run back and say, let me look on the website for WOW, there's one product put out by Ecomite. The others, there's a, there's a WOW um, Supreme or something, which is a totally different thing. There's a fertilizer that's got the same same names on it. So if folks who want to know what it is, uh, make sure you go to the right website or get a hold of the manager and say, what is it? This, what is this stuff uh, that you're, you're promoting? It sounds like a good idea. It sounds too good to be true, but maybe it's not. Thank you. One last comment, and, and everybody should know, uh, those of us who work you know, in the public service realm, we do not endorse individual products. You know, uh, a lot of these products need to be tested, uh, both for their efficacy and safety. You know, I have vendors come through my office on a regular basis, and, and right now it's very difficult to, to know what's out there and, and whether it is safe and effective, and it's something that probably the state of Florida is going to need to be uh, looking at down the line. Um, my name is Julia Held. I live at 718 Wimbro Drive. I'm a teacher and mother in this community. I just want to piggyback on, since we brought up products, um, there is a local gentleman who sells natural weed killer um, on Amazon, and he's doing very well. He's been a local advocate for years. Um, Dr. Kirshner's natural weed killer, and I would really like us to see, he had a study done, UCF just did a comprehensive six month um, intensive study on the efficacy of, I think I'm saying it wrong, but um, his product. So please, I want, I think he handed over a sample. Um, so I, you know, hey, I'm all about local. You know, we've got a local guy who's got something that's really great, and it would be nice if we could pursue that at least as one of the, the tests that we have in our area. Excuse me, what college was that that did the study? I think he said it was UCF. UCF? Yeah, you Thank can you. ask him, um, but it, in my recollection. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate that. Thank you. Any last uh, questions? Before I turn it over to the mayor, uh, Mr. Mayor, I'm going to turn this back over to you and uh, see well, where we go from here. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your, your input and your comments. Uh, just so we kind of stage this a little bit, um, we're going to have two workshops. Uh, we're having one on the 23rd at 1.30 in the afternoon. We did that so that uh, individuals who have a problem coming out in the evening can come to that workshop. Would you please encourage people that you know to come to the workshop? I would hate to have the same people come in and make the same comments at the second workshop. It wouldn't, it'd just be a waste of your time and a waste of ours, in, uh, although it's not a waste of time to deal with the issue. But if there's other people that you know that are interested, please um, ask them to come in here and give us their input. What we're doing right now is just gathering, uh, this is a classic process. It's been done in businesses and governments for a, a long time. We're gathering input. I've basically written down, I, Damien's written down, Count, Council Member Gilliams has written down, Vice Mayor Malti's written down. We've all written down a lot of the, the stuff that was said this evening. Uh, our overall intent is to take the information from this workshop and try to put together a, uh, a beginning uh, of a plan that we can then apply funding to, because it all has to be, we have to go through the funding process on that. And um, the, the more we get buy-in from the public, the better it is for us as we move forward. Uh, it has been, I think, as was mentioned earlier, it's been kind of contentious. We're past all that. Uh, it's not a, there's not an issue anymore about all of that. Um, what we want to do is come up with a plan that allows us to do what the city is required to do by DEP and the St. John's Water Management District. 
that allows us to clean up the, the canals, in the case of the canals, because we have a, a gigantic amount of work uh, that involves cleaning out what's already there. There's lots of Brazilian peppers and cabbage palms and other things that are growing in the canal. We have to remove those. We have to dredge parts of the canal area. That's a major investment. And then once we, once we do that, then we have to maintain that area. And I think, as uh, uh, Mr. Carlisle mentioned earlier, is that in some cases, if, if we go through into a wholesale dredging of a canal area, we won't know what's gonna, what we're going to have to do to maintain it until the stuff starts to come back and we know what's coming back in that, in that regard. Um, but the, the, the important issue is that we get community buy-in on this because this is a major financial impact on the city. It's probably one of the biggest financial impacts that the city's faced in a long time. And we have to place this into our budget cycle for next year. We have to start allocating dollars to it. And uh, I can tell you there's a lot more people than there in this room that the minute we tell them we're going to raise their taxes to do this, they're going to be in here screaming at us. So uh, we have to make sure that we give everybody an opportunity to be involved in this as we go through the process. Um, the city is committed. I, I, people don't know this, but Paul Carlisle is as much of an environmentalist as a lot of you are. They don't know it because he can't do that. He can't come in and, and scream that way. I don't think there's anybody on the council that has any issues at all with trying to do this the right way. Um, it's just a matter of getting through that. We have to look at the whole thing. We have to look at the canals. We have to look at the canal walls, which is also part of this big pro overall problem. Um, we have to look at not only how we, how we spray the, how we take care of weeds on the golf course, we have to, we have to look at how we rebuild that whole canal system. And the whole canal system south of 512 has to basically be rebuilt. We have to go in, clean it out, start to maintain it, and we may have to do uh, re wall replacements as part of that. It's a, it's, a big, it's a big, big deal, and it represents a lot of money. So the more public buy-in we can get, the better we are uh, in this process. So please let your neighbors and friends know about this workshop and the one we're going to have on the 23rd so we get additional people to come in and talk uh, when it comes to that. Yes, um, Anybody else? You have anybody have any questions about Can what I just said? Can we advertise that, Mr. Mayor? I'm sorry? Can we advertise the next meeting? Have a what? Can we advertise our next meeting? It's, it's, it's advertised, yes. It has been advertised. Where? But I, I, people, this is, this is my perception in, in government. People don't come in unless they're mad. No, mad simple, simple, the right okay. People don't come in unless they're mad. And the fact that I just got through saying we might raise their taxes might generate some of that. <laughs> they I might get mad and then come in. So, input from that. Well, you got to, if you're going to talk, you got to come up, if you would. Yeah. Uh, um, we have to get you on. Input, input on the money, Mr. Mayor. Uh, there have been grants available for, for five years. Wait, wait, let me hear, hear me out. Last, last week, you shut me off. There are grants available. We never apply for these grants. And you're saying it's going to be a hardship for the people. There's money available, okay. Mr. Mayor. I, I, I'm not, I understand. I'm not going to take that. I understand that. I understand that. I also understand the practicalities of having to manage those grants and apply for those grants. And if we have to hire three people to do grant management, wait. If we have to hire three people to do grant management, that is money that has to flow through our budget. That's all I'm saying to you. So there's there we have the city has to manage this. Dr. Cox said uh, really well a little while ago, I think, when he talked about his integrated pest management plan, is management is what makes them fail. So that's exactly what I heard him say. The city has to manage this whole process, which means we have to have staff to do it. We have to, to know that we can, that if we apply for a grant, we can effectively use it. The worst thing we can do is apply for a grant, not be able to use it, and then that's, that's the killer to us. For any grant process we go through is we have to be extremely careful for that process. So I understand there's grant money available. We have to define the problem, take that problem then into the grant process to try to solve, to try to, try to get grant money when we do that. And I, we certainly are going to do that. That's, that's going to be done. I, I, it, it's, easy to, it's easy to say that, and I'm not questioning you, I'm just telling you, it's easy to say that. Bob. Yeah. Stand down on this. I'll, I'll be working with the city. You know, we've been talking about grants. The mayor is absolutely right. The worst thing you can do is to rush into a grant process and not be ready for that magic moment where all of a sudden you get the money and you got 12 months to deliver and you simply aren't ready to deliver that grant because if you fail, you're not going to get another grant. And so the, the mayor is absolutely right. There is a process to this. 
Uh, we will work directly with the city uh, as the NEP, like we do with all of our partners, to make sure uh, that uh, they've got the information they need to do successful grant writing and delivery. Okay. You have something to say? Yes. Getting back to promoting. Yeah. Pull it closer. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Can Thanks. everybody hear me? Yeah. Getting back to the next meeting, which is um, it's 23rd an evening, the 23rd. Oh, it's in the afternoon. Yeah. Can we uh, suggest or direct the city clerk to go ahead and put a one-eighth page in the press journal, which the majority of the people in this community, the seniors, and, and just basically yeah. requesting people to come with the issues and the solutions so that we can hear everybody out, more importantly. But and maybe run the ad twice on Saturday and Sunday because Sunday's a big paper in the town where everybody reads it. And if we get it in the right section, maybe as well as putting it in the Sebastian River and the hometown news. There's three papers that I think we can reach and maybe work with some of the famous websites on, online. Uh, I don't want to leave them out either. They do a good job in letting everybody know what's going on in town. So, yeah, if, you, if we can maybe set aside a small budget for, so we can fill this place up and get some input and get some solutions and talk yeah, about I, the issues. That's a good idea. Let's do that. Yeah? Let's do it. Okay. Yeah. Bob, would that satisfy you? Yeah, I think. Okay. He said we get low turnout. Okay. Okay. The other thing, the, the other thing I want to mention is in the January 2nd uh, opinion page in the Press Journal, uh, there was a very good article about don't let agriculture dictate water policy. And as you all know, we have agriculture west of town in Felsmere. And their drainage ditches feed into, I think, C-54 Canal, if I'm not mistaken. So there is a lot of runoff that comes from the west. And there is some legislation that's being pushed through. The governor has put a task force together to address a lot of these issues, not just up here in, in our area where it's agriculture, but mainly down by Lake Okeechobee uh, and uh, the other sources of pollution. But there's a bill, 712, it's called the Clean Water Ways Act. And you should be in contact with your, your representatives uh, and your senators and get up to speed on it so that they know how you feel about what's going on. And um, uh, the bill is about 100 pages. There's about 28 pages of study and analysts uh, in it. So, again, it's SB 712. It's already passed the Community Affairs Committee unanimously on December 9th. So, if everybody chimes in on that and speaks to their representatives, I can also assist. Is there a house equivalent? Pardon me? Is there a house equivalent? Uh, I, I just see the Senate. The Senate one. Yeah, right now. Um, I didn't see the one on the House, but I'm sure they're going to be looking for a partner. So, I just wanted to bring that to everybody's attention also. I believe there is a house companion bill. Uh, what I'll do is I'll give the city manager our list. You know, bills are still dropping, so it's hard to keep up. Uh, but I've got right now a comprehensive list to about a week ago on water bills, both Indian River Lagoon and the broader bills. So I'll get that to the city manager, and he can distribute. Good. Fabulous. Thank you. Mr. Pikesmere, do you have anything? No, I have nothing on this right Okay. All right. Uh, this has been a good session. Thank you guys for coming. Uh, we're now adjourned.